the valley. The valley is uh, an interesting place to be in, in practice. And let me, let me describe this to you. In the figurative world of the practitioner's journey, the valley is this beautiful location that you arrive at on your journey as a practitioner. Um, waterfalls, crystal clear blue water, forest, high cliff walls. It's beautiful, it's serene, it's natural, it's pure. And in our metaphorical journey, it's this physical place. In terms of practice, uh, in, in the literal world of your practice, the valley is this place that we find ourselves in often after some time in practice where we've reached what we sort of feel is this sweet spot that we've always looked for, which is where we have a steady supply of new patients. We have patients coming back. The phone is ringing. We have some financial abundance and a lot of our work is starting to pay off. What is most interesting and challenging about this place that I call the Valley is that for all its beautiful and, ser- and for its for all its beauty and its serenity, it can also be a a place of deception and of and of danger to you in your career. I talk about this on being careful what you wish for, and I, I say that a little bit tongue in cheek. But we tend to start our businesses and our careers with this great hope to be to this great wish to ha- to be busier to have more new patients, to have the phone ringing more, to earn more money, to reach more people, to help more people, to have our schedule full. And at some mysterious point in time, I think it's often without realizing it, something tips and we suddenly find we ourselves wishing the opposite. I, I wish the phone would stop ringing. I wish I had a little more time in my schedule. I wish there weren't so many people clamoring for my help. And so this place, this beautiful place that we aspire to be to in the valley is is a challenging place as well because it requires us to make difficult decisions and to juggle difficult demands. And I want to give you a practical example of what I'm talking about. I interviewed a practitioner named Gabe, who, uh, this is after about, I think, six or seven years in practice for Gabe, maybe even a little less, had 12,000 patient files, 12 plus practitioners in his clinic, revenue of over two and a half million dollars a year and an income well north of $300,000 personally, as well as a number of perks. What was interesting about Gabe's situation is on the surface, um, he had all of what we might consider traditional markers of success. And this is, bear in mind, this is the practice and the business that Gabe always wanted. So this was Gabe's aspiration and he had, and he had got it. And it certainly has what many of us would wish for in terms of being busy and earning a good income and being able to reach and help many people. What was interesting when Gabe and I got to talk a little longer is what he said to me. Eventually I started to wonder, would this be easier for them if I wasn't here? Now this is Gabe talking about his family, his wife and children. You find yourself looking at your life insurance, wondering if it might be better if you weren't around. That's when you realize you've become a patient. You cross the line from helping to needing help. Now, as you can imagine, this is a, a, this is a profound moment sort of to have someone tell you this. Someone who has on the surface sort of overachieved in terms of, of, of of traditional markers of success, like patient visits and revenue and earning, earning a living and, and reaching people and building a brand. Um, And it's a perfect example of the valley where too much can be too much and too much of something can be a bad thing unless you are properly able to manage that something. Now, the good news about Gabe is that he was able to recognize that and he was really on the brink of burnout when uh, when I spoke with him and I've met many other practitioners like him since. And he was able to, to sort of catch himself he was able to, to, to define his boundaries, to recognize the valley and to, to, uh, and to leave the valley and, and, and move to a better place. But the lesson that comes from Gabe, and I think from what we see in many other practitioners and many other professions as well, 
is fairly direct and important. And that is your practice will take everything from you if you let it. You as healthcare professionals, I think, are more susceptible to this idea of burnout and this idea of being trapped in your profession. You're more susceptible than many professionals, I believe, partly because of your disposition and your personality and your nature, partly because of the business you're in. Balance and sustainability at some point requires you to say the word no. And that is not something that many healthcare professionals are trained to do or equipped to do. Uh, and that's not necessarily a bad thing in terms of your nature at all. It's probably what makes you uh, so well loved by your patients and so successful in many ways. But in many ways, it's also dangerous because it's not sustainable. So it's important to remember this. If you let your practice it will take everything from you. And I think the key word here is that is the if you let it part. What we're going to do tonight is work through a way of making sure that this doesn't happen. This scary idea of burnout is what we're trying to avoid. Too much time in the pressure cooker of the valley without creating careful boundaries and without thinking ahead without making the tough decisions um, puts you squarely in burnout territory. What's interesting about burnout and why I want to talk about it briefly before we sort of get into solutions and avoiding it. Um, burnout is most definitely best addressed early. Burnout is much like health. It's, uh, it's better treated as in, in the form of prevention than it is to actually treat it after it's happened. But what's interesting about it is that our perception generally about burnout is very much about time, that it's about overwork, that it's about the 100-hour weeks or the 80-hour weeks. It's about um, not having enough time to take care of ourselves and, and our relationships. Um, and there's a great deal of truth in that. But what's interesting is that we dig into burnout and we, when we look into the research and when we start to look at practitioners and work with them the way that we have, you discover that there are these less than obvious factors contributing to burnout and they're I think equally important and so we, before we get into this I want to look at what those are just briefly we have this obvious side of burnout which is just pure overwork pure volume of patient hours and running your business and your practice uh, not enough time what's not so obvious are these other factors the first being money there is a direct link between I think between the money in your practice and burnout and this is in a couple of ways the first is that if you can't manage money and you don't have enough of it that is a driving force for you to work more and that puts you squarely back into that time category where you're working more than you want to working more than you should working more than you need to money has another interesting um, uh, part, part of this equation in that um, If you can't manage money in your own personal budget, it's going to impact you in your office as well. So we're going to get into that a little bit later. Your sheer impact that you perceive you have with, practice, with, your, with your patients, this is a basically a locus, control, a locus of control issue. Do you feel like you have an impact with your patients? Do they comply? Do you have a sense of control over the future of your practice. These are all factors that impact and burnout. And an interesting study um, showed that one of the highest burnout uh, professions was actually nurses who worked in burn wards because they were simply unable to alleviate the suffering of their patients. And, uh, and the burnout rate was incredibly high in that particular scenario. So your level of control you feel over your schedule, your practice, the level of impact you have uh, in working with your patients, these all play into your risk of, uh, of burnout. Um, your perception of the future, as you look down the road to your practice, is it an optimistic outlook? Do you feel like your practice is heading towards something? These all affect your ability to tolerate strain and stress. And lastly, the fit of your patients and the people you work with. Um, if that's something that energizes you and brings you joy, your resilience 
in working longer hours and treating more people tends to rise as well. So we've got these obvious and not so obvious factors, all of which are tied together in this very intricate web. Um, what we want to do during our next couple of hours together is address all of these in uh, using a series of strategies to, that, that work and impact on one or more of them at, at, at the same time. How do you know if you're in this mysterious place we, uh, we call the valley? How is it that you start to recognize that you're in this place where it feels like where you want to be, but at the same time you're at risk of burnout? Because this is the story of the valley, is this, is this feeling like everything is where it should be, and then one day you reach the tipping point and you burn out. There's the obvious physical signs of burnout, um, being exhausted. Uh, your immune system giving up, getting sick more often. More subtle than that are signs of disengagement in your practice. When you are getting out of bed with less than your usual enthusiasm for going to work, or you simply don't want to go at all. If you find you are reaching the limits of your time and earnings, so if your income has been the same for some time and your schedule is quite full, then you essentially have reached the limits of, of your existing practice or solo practice, and that puts you at risk uh, for burnout over the course of time. If you find yourself using the word can't a lot more than you used to, I can't take a three-week vacation, I can't take a maternity leave, I can't go on sabbatical, I can't find time to take care of my health, these are all signs that you're that you're in the valley and things are headed towards something that's not going to be sustainable for you in the long run. And if you've got concerns about the future, if you're looking down the road and you find yourself more and more anxious about your ability to handle the caseload that you have now and the demands of your business, or concerns about where your practice is heading in terms of providing you with a retirement, if that's something you're interested in, or its future value in terms of getting out of practice one day. These are all signs that you may be in this deceptive place that I, that I call the valley. The valley is fundamentally about two things. And we're going to look at both of them in a very broad sense tonight. And each of the strategies, when we get into specifics tonight, they're all addressing some aspect of this. The first is about drawing very clear lines around your time. It's about drawing, a, as I call them, drawing a line in the sand and saying, no, this is what my practice can have. And this is often easier said than done. And we, we're going to look at some, some ways to get leverage on yourself and to, uh, to make sure that those lines in, the, lines in the sand stay established when there are people clamoring at you from all sides, threatening to cross over them. So, Valley is first and foremost about drawing those lines, about creating boundaries. The Valley is then about choosing whether or not to transition from practice to business, particularly from solo practice to, um, to a business that involves more than, than just you seeing, uh, seeing patients. And so everything we do tonight is going to address one of those two issues in, in one way or the other. What does leaving the valley look like? And I'll give you an example from our from our personal life. In 2006, seven, uh, there's my there's my wife and business partner Tara and myself. Uh, we left our town, left the business. We packed up our five year old daughter, Eve. We got on a plane and we went to Paraguay, South America, for five months. We went to a tiny little rural area and lived at a, a camp for homeless children. And we set up a free medical clinic there for the local rural area. People would walk for miles to, to come and get uh, free uh, health care from the doctora. And uh, we lived there. We set up sustainable agricultural pro uh, projects there. That's us planting tomatoes on the right. And there's Tara with, uh, with a, a cute little patient on the left. And this is how we spent five months. Our daughter um, went to school in a tiny little one-room mud brick schoolhouse and learned to speak Spanish. It was 
a remarkable experience. It was everything that we had hoped it would be and more. Um, and perhaps I think if, if not the most satisfying part of the journey, at least a very rewarding part of the journey was to come back home after almost half a year away and uh, to a practice that was still there and a business that had been profitable in our absence. That for us was our, our leaving the valley moment. That transitioned us from uh, a solo practice where Tara saw all the patients to, um, to a business that, uh, that involved other people and could make money in our absence and that could give us the freedom to, uh, to do things like this. Um, it was evidence to, to me that this was more than possible and more than worthwhile. And I want to, I want to assure you, you may may not be interested in this type of thing, or you may be, but I want to assure you that the skills and the life situation and the advantages that you need to do this are perhaps not what you think. I think this is something that's available to anyone. If you've, if you've won the genetic lottery and the lifestyle lottery enough to be able to become an acupuncturist, in other words, you've pursued a post-secondary education and started a practice, you have every, everything you need to build a sustainable practice that can deliver you these types of choices in practice. And I think if you will ask me to sum up balance and sustainability in practice, it's all about the freedom to choose, to be able to make choices like this, to be able to make a choice to uh, take a parental leave and stay home with your new child, to take long vacations with your family, to take care of your health. The freedom to feel like you can make those decisions will do more to contribute to your sustainable career than anything else I can think of. That's what I talk about when I'm talking about leaving the valley is being able to make those choices. And, uh, and I think I'll, you'll see as we get into this tonight that much of work-life balance and sustainability in your career is about making a choice. And uh, that's what I want to help you with over the next little while. For more information on this or other Prodi Live, distance or online courses, please visit www.prodiseminars.com.